time for our regular product review, where we look at some new innovation in the paddling marketplace that is within the reach of the rank and file paddler in this country. This time, the old CX Maxi has got a brand new baby brother called the Jacana. Let's have a look at it, and then we'll take it out for a paddle. As we head into winter, we're heading into K1 season at Swartland and Berg, just around the corner. So everybody's talking about the new singles on the market. And the newest mass market boat on the market is a boat called the Jacana that's come out of Neisner Racing. The Jacana, by the way, is a little lily hopping bird that you find down in the Eastern Cape. This boat is what we respect as paddlers. When a manufacturer takes a currently successful boat and they put time and resources into developing it and refining it even further. It's not cheap to make new plugs and new molds. And when they do that, they deserve a heads up from the paddling community. And that's exactly what we've done. Because as you can see in front of me here is the parent of the Jacana the world famous CX Maxi now, which for a couple of seasons has been one of the most popular river boats around. Now, what the Neisner Racing team have done is they've looked to refine this boat without altering any of its boat feel and its stability. And they've done that in a couple of crucial ways. When you were paddling the CX Maxi, you noticed very early on that there was a secondary wave that pushed up early, quite a big wave as well, which hinted at the fact that it was a bit of an inefficient design. One of the things that they've done with the new Jacana, they've gone and slimmed away part of the front of the nose, which you'll see straight away in the secondary wave. And it also hints at the fact that this boat is going to be far sleeker in the water and far more performance oriented. And they've done the same thing at the back of the boat. You saw quite a pronounced bulge in the CX Maxi here. It did give you a chunkier extra bit of volume, maybe a little bit of extra stability, but that's also been shaved away on this boat. And that too, you can see on the wave that comes out behind the boat. Remember anything behind the paddler, behind the cockpit is drag related and it's inefficient. So trimming this away is unlikely to affect the boat feel, but it's definitely going to improve the uh, stability of the boat. If you have a look at the profiles of the two boats, the first thing you're gonna see is that they fixed up the banana problem in the back of the boat. The old CX Maxi had a lot of banana in the bottom. The Jacana has had that straightened out. That's the single big development. What we also enjoy about the boat is that there are a lot of very special new touches that have happened under the skin of the boat. For example, the Neisner Racing crew have put together brand new cable runners that are made entirely out of carbon. Neat touch and I think they're going to be really hard wearing. And what I love about the boat is that they have a brand new completely integrated foot plate with the Neisner pumps built into it. The pedals sit beautifully on top. There's no doubt that that assembly is the best of its kind in the country. The other thing we're going to do before we put this on the water is we're going to attack a completely unrelated issue. The Neisner boat, as it's turned out, is geared towards a Neisner and a Cape market. As it comes off the shelf, it tends to be a light, very sleek, a beautiful boat to handle. But when it comes up to hard wearing rivers, like the Bushmans or the Umco or maybe the Doozy, the boat tends to take a bit of a battering. Now, the question we're going to ask is, is the fault in the design of the boat or is the fault in the boat that the paddler has ordered? So what we're going to do, we're going to try it out, give it a test on flat water. Then we're going to take it up to the Umzum Kulu, medium to low, rocks galore. We're going to give it a pounding because the boat that we've set up here is different to the CX Maxi. It's about a kg heavier, but this critically is a river layup ordered boat. Right, let's go and check how she handles. On flat water, the same comfortable stability and handling of a CX Maxi, but with markedly more speed and performance characteristics. Now, for the second half of the test, let's check its strength. The Umzumkulu and Tomos to check out turning and handling and strength of the hull. The drop stern providing very direct responsiveness and no loss in turning ability in the changed rocker. The rock certainly giving it a pounding, but the layup holding up fine, and to test the seams, we race it down the mine shaft. And that proves that the river layup and the seams are tough enough to take any beating. It doesn't happen that often, so when a totally new multi-day race surfaces on the calendar, it tends to create quite a buzz, and that's exactly what the Green Kalahari Canoe Marathon did this year. With the strong backing of the Northern Cape government, the race lured some big names with a prize pot of 270,000 Rand. Sitting at the tail end of the river season and being brand new, it was always going to attract a small field of adventurous explorers keen to take part, and they were all on the start line for the briefing ahead of day one of three. I think today will be um, a quite a tricky race. Um, I think there is like that. Um, we just uh, listened to, to the briefing now. Um, it's quite a few channels you have to look out. Also, the river is not so full. So I think it's more of choosing the good lines and making sure that you don't get stuck on the rocks. Eh? Day one of the three days started in Uppington, 34 kilometers to the overnight stop at Aranya As the fancy paddlers got ready to set off into the unknown. 
Abby and I are so excited. We're just so happy to be here. It's very daunting not knowing what we're going into. Some serious crews on the water. Tulani and Banjua and Sponello Zondi. Lance King teaming up with Heinrich Schlomps and Pierre-André Rabi in the boats with Gavin White. The Orange River running pretty low. The water release was just behind them, it turns out. Hasn't this been the story of the summer? 24 boats on the start line in the end, every one of them a pioneer in their own right. The organisers had done one heck of a job wrecking the river, making sure that it was safe and paddleable, and ensuring that where it wasn't, like Eusta Eiland, that there were clear, manageable portages laid out. From this classic chopper shot you get an idea of how low the water was in the usually mighty orange for this inaugural race. But still there was plenty of breakneck racing going on at the front, King and Schlomps asserting themselves. The river had a fair number of rapids but none of them really threatening, making for an enjoyable and manageable outing as it was a first time trip down the three day race for virtually every single one of the paddlers. Some breathtaking Northern Cape scenery and great fun rapids being enjoyed by Abby, AD and Hilary Pitchford. Back up front and Mbanjwa and Zondi are taking up the pull from Pierre-André Rabi and Gavin White who are in the boat together for the very first time. The top paddlers are being decidedly cautious mainly because nobody knows the stretch of water at all and an overzealous mistake could be very costly. Narrowing in on the end of day one, the finish at Oranje Riss and it's Lance King and Heinrich Schlomps who have the overnight bragging rights. It was a very, very shallow river. We were just very technical, we had to watch out for all the rocks. Uh, our glass fiber boats took a lot of strain and a lot of knocks a day. But luckily we managed to take the end sprint and also the hard spot prize, so we're very glad that we're in first place now. Most of the pack remained pretty close together over the 35 km first stage into Oranuris, everybody keeping enough energy in hand for the end sprint that inevitably decides the look of the final placing on the leaderboard. Race within a race here, as Abby Adie and Hilary Pitchford are targeting a top eight overall. They're the only women's boat in the race and racing against the men. We'll be back to enjoy day two and day three of the Green Kalahari Canoe Marathon later in the show. The finish at Oranuris and a welcome sight for the paddlers. Lance well, King and Heinrich Schlomps leading home the leaders. Hilary Pitchford and Abby Adie on target for their top eight. <laughs> Hank McGregor of Durban hit the headlines by winning his second World Marathon Champs title last year. We spent some time with Hank to get inside the head of the new World K1 champion. This being the first time that I've actually paddled the boats, all the paddles. I swore when I crossed the line, I, I'd made a, a, a promise to Kayak Centre that I'd never use the craft again. And uh, it was quite a strange feeling to actually pick it up and to get back in the water and, and to paddle, take one or two strokes. I just remembered World Champs like it was yesterday. I remember the pain that I went through the last time when I was paddling it. You know, it was it, it was a tough race, and, and and for me, it was it was probably one of my greatest, if not my greatest, achievement in, in paddling. You know, so f for me, it's just memories that just it's like almost overwhelming. You know, like it's it's just something that when you you sit the seats exactly where you should have it, the, the paddle length, everything just seems so right. You know, so there's a lot of memories that come across, but uh, yeah, I can't help but smile about it. Look, for me, the, the best achievement that I could have got was to win a world title. And against that field, I mean, there was just world champions just splattered all over the place, Olympic medalists. A kilometre and a half after the start, I found myself looking on my left-hand shoulder and uh, it was silent and there was no one there. And I looked on my right-hand shoulder and it was silent, there was no one there. It was a strange feeling to, to realise that all of a sudden, you had just dropped everybody in the world all within a K and a half, you know, and uh, there was a lot of critics be before had told me that I don't have the speed anymore. And I looked around, there was nobody with me, and that's when I 
suddenly you realize maybe it's now or never, let's just get out there and go for it, you know? Then whoever comes is, is gonna have to work hard to catch me. I look back, I saw four of, of probably the best paddlers in the world trying to catch me, you know? And, and that's a, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible feeling, knowing that they're working together to catch you. And after 10, 15 minutes, they were just starting to disappear. And every turn I went around, I could see they were getting further and further back. I paddled around and I, I came to this the dead zone in, 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 the, in the course, if you want to put it, it's the, like the quiet zone. But it's dead, there's nothing happening there. There's no, there's no boats, there's no people, there's no one, you know. And, um, and I said to myself, listen, I think you should stop. And everything told me not to, but at the same time, I said, you're still okay, you're still, you're still confident, you're still feeling good, you're not tired, you, but you, you've got to now make a decision. You've got an hour left to go, probably in the race and uh, I realized, okay, this is it, you know. And I knew as I came through, I had practiced, I'd, count, I'd counted my strokes before. So I started counting down 40, 39, and by the 20 strokes to go, I realized, I knew I had it, you know, and it was just an unbelievable feeling, you know. And I, I actually never doubled up and kicked down. It was, it was more like an excitement paddle to the finish, you know. But I felt the water rushing to the back of the boat as I was picking up speed, and the noise of the crowd, and oh, it was just, it was one of those moments that you just, I'll never forget, you know. Yeah, last year my sister had a bad car accident. Um, and I realized then, you know, one minute you're here, the next minute you're not, you know, and, uh, you know, she, she, it, it, was, it was a terrible moment in our family, you know, for, for us, I mean, it, she was this close to losing her life. She actually passed away, then she came back, they brought her around, and I realized, you know, I mean, it could happen to me tomorrow. And just enjoy it, you enjoy paddling, and, and I, I seemed to click to another level, you know, from that day. You know, it, I was paddling for more than just myself. You know, I was paddling for everything about paddling, as well as my family, and and a lot was to do with my sister. You know, and and she, she, I think her that accident it, it it changed my life for for the better. Taking paddling seriously when I was younger was was a lot to do with my father, and um, being my coach, and uh, you know that motto: first is first, second is nothing. You know, you live by the sword, die by the sword type of attitude, and. Um, you know, for me, there was a lot of pressure to, to show that I could do it, you know, and um, after you've won a world title, you know, there's no other place to go other than to win another one. I think for the paddling community to remember me in 50 years' time, I think when somebody mentioned my name, somebody, as long as they smile, I think that's how I want to be remembered, just as somebody that, <laughs> that was different, you know, that, that's all I want. There's always going to be some guy that will break records, that's why there's a record, you know. Some guy will break my records or win the same amount of titles or maybe even more in, in time to come but you know I, I did it first. Still to come the second half of our look at the Green Kalahari Canoe Marathon. Then we make a trip into the Tugela Valley. Then we chat to the nutritional experts at the High Performance Center. We go beyond the back line for surf ski news and we catch up with your latest submissions of hot clips.